Amen. Amen. I'm gonna, I'm, we're going to have fun today because I, li- I like this sermon. All right, I'm excited. All right. So uh, the first thing I want to do is have, I have a confession to make. Um, some of you guys are new. You might not know this about me, so I want to go ahead and put it out there. Uh, my name is Mike, and I love football, and I love the Miami Dolphins, okay? I'm sorry to say that. You know, I'm not sorry to say that. I'm actually proud to say that, so deal with it, okay? Um, I've actually been super excited about football right now, and especially my team over the last couple of weeks. Some of you are like, football's not even happening right now. That's why you're excited. There's no chance for them to lose. Maybe, maybe there's some of that, all right? But the truth is, this is the off season, which means like trades are happening. Teams are trading players, and, and there's excitement. And my team, my personal team, the Miami Dolphins, have actually just traded for one of the best players in the NFL. So I'm really excited about that. But everybody say trade. We've all made trades before. You know that, right? Ever since we were little, we were making trades. I make, I make a trade every single day, actually. Every single day, my six-year-old, my little one, uh, when we sit down to eat any meal uh, that we do at all, she will sit there and she will eat three bites of her food and then go, Dad, if I eat two more bites of this broccoli, can I be done? Then there's a slight pause and she goes, and get dessert, <laughs> right? Anybody have kids? Anybody making trades? Yeah. How many of y'all remember middle school? I remember middle school. I was a professional trader in middle school. I could, I mean, I, you could, you, you'd think you'd send me to go work the stock exchange, right? When it came to lunchtime, it was trade time, okay? You got your food, you sat down, and you're like, okay, I'll give you my milk for your french fries, <laughs> right? Or, or listen, I'll give you this weird square pizza slice for your really hard brownie. Right? Anybody do those trades in middle school? Anybody remember those days? Right? Everybody makes trades, right? I'm going to tell you this. In college, um, any, I made the worst trade of my life. Anybody make a bad trade? Anybody ever had to live out a bad trade? I think I, I feel like I made one of the worst trades of my life in college. Um, uh, in college, we owned, uh, we were a family of three as me, Tammy, and, and, and Micah, our little boy. And uh, we, we, had, um, we had a car that we had bought at a police auction. All right? This was our car right there. All right? It was an undercover uh, cop car, right? A, a Chevy Caprice. And you're like, what is that, Pastor Mike? You sound proud of that. Listen, I was ghetto fabulous. Listen, I was happy in my Chevy Caprice, all right? Undercover cop car, had a souped up engine because it was a cop car, um, had a searchlight. Well, you looking at me? I turned that thing on from the driver's side. And uh, it was cool. I liked it, all right? And um, I put a killer system in it, all right? Some of y'all are like, what does that mean? It means it had a couple of 12-inch subs in the back, has some mids, some highs. I mean, the whole system, all right? I, you heard me coming. Before I turned the corner, you're like, I think Mike's coming down the street. Yes, that was, that was me, okay? And uh, my bride, as a young man, I was probably 18, 17, 18 at that time, uh, my bride had bought me a, a new radio. It was the latest, one of the latest radios that came out. This was the 90s, late 90s. So um, you remember the radios where the face came off? Oh, yeah, that's what I had. That's what she hooked me up with. As a matter of fact, the radio spoke through the speakers. In other words, I'd turn on my car, it'd wait about five seconds, and then it would go, hello, Mike. <laughs> and for some reason, it always made me lean back a little bit when, <laughs> when it said that, you know? And, um, and that was my car, okay? And that was our car for a little while. And uh, when we went to college, about 19, 20, um, we realized, like, we, we car had a lot of miles on it. It was... I mean, the cops who drove it before me drove it hard, and um, we knew we needed to get a bigger car, okay? So, uh, you know, I'm still young. I'm 19. I got to look cool, like, you know? So uh, we ain't going to just trade it for any other car. We need a bigger car. Okay, cool. We're going to get an SUV, because everybody knows SUVs are still, still cool. You know, you put a system in an SUV, you're still riding, you know, riding cool. So um, that, was, that was the plan. Everybody say everybody's got a plan. And then I walked onto the used car dealership with my plan. And um, the, 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 <laughs> why y'all laughing? And the, um, the sales guy um, was really, really good. He was so good, I did not realize what was happening to me until it was already happened to me. And right at the end of me talking to this guy and he's showing me the cars I want to see at first and then the cars he wants me to see um, I'm sitting there talking about a car. We all come down to a deal, and I'm like, all right, we ready to do this? And he's like, yeah. I was like, all right, all I got to do is take out my system. I'll put all the stock stuff back in the car, and then we got this done. And he's like, oh, um, no, the system comes with it. And I remember thinking like, oh, I, 
that's part of me. Like, I, I put all that in there. I, that's my, oh, and you know what he says? He looks at me and he says, um, think of your family. I told y'all he was good. So, of course, like, he got me all on my feels, and I'm thinking about my little boy and my wife, and, you know, this is on. Listen, it took me three days after this day, after this deal was made, to realize I was hoodwinked. That man had bamboozled me into the worst trade of my life. Listen, not only did I agree to give up my system, right? Remember, I'm like 19, 20, all right? I'm still a young man. I not only gave up my system, but I didn't drive away in an SUV. Somehow, I found myself driving this. If you're online, it's a minivan on the screen. Somehow, I went from 19 in the, from the hood to a soccer mom in, in one afternoon. I, I don't know what happened. There's nothing like that feeling when you roll up to your baseball team and you're like, what's, what's, what's up, guys? And you just put your head down, right? I could take the whole team with me. <laughs> Listen to me. We've all made bad trades, right? Everybody's made bad trades. I love sports. Here's a couple of crazy bad trades in sports. In 1996, the Charlotte basketball team had the 13th pick in the draft, which is a pretty good pick. But they traded it for a guy. They gave that pick to Los Angeles for a guy named Vladi Divac, Okay. And you're like, Vladi, what? Yeah, that's a guy, right? But guess who the Los Angeles Lakers got with that 13th pick that was traded to them? Kobe Bryant. Like they could have had Kobe Bryant, but instead they got Mr. Divac. Like that's a bad trade, right? Or how about in 1983, the Colts traded away a guy that they had sitting on their bench for a guy named Mark Herman. Everybody remember Mark Herman? No, you don't. Nobody knows Mark Herman. You know who they traded away, who that guy was? John Elway. Super Bowl champion, John Elway. Like, it's wild to think of some bad trades. We've all made bad trades. So since we're talking about trades, everybody say trades. Trades. I found a trade in the Bible, actually a few of them that we're going to talk about today. The main one is in Genesis 25, and it's a trade that involves food, more specifically a bowl of soup, Okay. So let me tell you this story. I love telling stories, so let me tell you this story, and we'll pull some truths out of it. There's a guy named Isaac and a girl named Rebecca. Isaac and Rebecca get married, and the plan back then is simple. You get married, and you have kids, right? So they're trying to have kids, but they can't, right? They're they're struggling to have kids. So uh, what do they do? They They know Jesus. They know God. Isaac knows God. So he goes to God, and they ask him for help. This is what it says. Genesis 25, 21, it says, Isaac pleaded with the Lord on behalf of his wife because she was, what's that word? It's important to know that word, unable to have children. The Lord answered Isaac's prayer and Rebecca became pregnant with twins. That's a cool miracle right there. I don't know if you know how cool that is, but that's, that's pretty incredible. Now I want you to notice something. It doesn't say that she didn't have children. It said that she was, what was that word? She was unable right? She couldn't have children. It wasn't something they were doing wrong. It wasn't like she was unable to have children. Now, I don't know if there's anybody in this place right now that um, it has faced or is facing something that seems unsurmountable. So, some big situation that maybe seems impossible. Let me tell you a truth that if it's the only one you get today, it's good enough. God can do anything and nothing is impossible for him. God can do anything, and nothing is impossible for him. Rebecca couldn't have children. Isaac prays to God. God shows up, and he shows out. Not only is she pregnant, but she's pregnant with twins. It's pretty amazing, right? You know what? Let's take a time out right here. If you're here in the room right now, and you're facing something that feels like it's impossible, like I, I, maybe, maybe you're here and you are a couple just like them and you've been trying to have kids or you got a, you got a word from somebody and they said, look, you're not gonna be able to have kids. Maybe it's that. Maybe you got a word from a doctor that gave you some terrible news that you feel like, man, I don't know how we're gonna get past this. Listen, I don't care what the situation is because God doesn't care what the situation is, but you feel like you need a God that can show up in an impossible situation and turn it into a possible reality that God can change. You need the impossible God to show up to make things possible, Amen. 
If you're in this room and you feel like that, I'm not going to embarrass you, but I do believe this. If Isaac can pray to that God, that same God is alive today, and we can pray to that same God, and he can make your situation change. So let's take a time out. And if you're here and you're like, I have one of those impossible situations, I don't need to know the situation, neither does anybody in this room, but God knows it. And we're going to knock on the doors of heaven and ask him to change it, to show up and show out. So if that's you, would you just kind of raise your hand? All right, nobody move, but look around the room. You see somebody, you can leave it up, leave your hand up. If you see a hand up in your, in your area, just like the force, stretch your hands in their direction. And close your eyes and let's pray. Jesus, right now, I pray for every person that has their hand raised in this room. I pray in Jesus' name that you would show up and show out like you did in Isaac and Rebecca's life. They came to you with an impossible situation and you turned it upside down. You not only made it possible, but you went the extravagant way, the extra step and gave them twins. So in Jesus' name, would you show up in every life that has their hands up right now? Would you do the extravagant, the incredible, the impossible? Would you show up and show out in a way, in such a way that nobody can give glory but you because only God can show up and do the things you're gonna do? We believe you for it, Lord, so we come to you. In Jesus' name, everybody said, amen. Amen. Time in. Back into the story. So she's pregnant. They don't have sonograms back then. You all know that, right? So she's pregnant with something. That's all she knows. <laughs> this is what the Bible says. The day comes for her to have what she has. Verses 24 and 25. And it says, and when the time came to give birth, Rebecca discovered that she indeed, indeed had twins, right? Was having twins. 25, verse 25. The first one was very, it starts being descriptive here. I think, the, I think this is funny. The first one was very red at birth and covered with thick hair, like a fur coat. So they named him Esau. Sometimes people take this, this too seriously, the Bible too seriously. It's all real, but when I read that, I got to be honest. See, the Bible says the first one comes and it's a boy, but then it says he's very red and his whole body is hairy, like a fur coat. And I sat there for a minute and I thought, did this lady have an orangutan? <laughs> what in the world just happened? <laughs> y'all are looking at me and laughing like you judged me, but y'all know this is crazy. Rebecca looks at her little bundle of joy, that little hairy baby. (laughs) I I wish I would be there just so I could see um, Isaac's face. (laughs) She names him, she names him Esau. Can I tell you what Esau means? Harry. Harry. (laughs) Who names their baby Harry? I, wait, unless your name is Harry, H-A-R-R-Y, in that case, I love your name, sir. <laughs> but she named him H-A-I-R-Y, Harry. Let's keep going before I get in trouble with a Harry in here. There's a Harry in here. Genesis 25, 26 says, then the other twin was born and his hand was grasping Esau's heel. This is interesting. So they named him Jacob. Isaac was 60 years old when the twins were born. Now we have the second baby, right? And he's actually born. When he's born, he has not let go of his brother's heel, right? As he's born, his brother's born, little hairy baby. And there's a hand holding onto his leg, and, and, and his mom names him Jacob. Anybody want to take a guess what Jacob means? Holder of the heel. <laughs> this lady is not creative at all, right? Like, I'm glad this lady didn't name me, all right? Cause, and you're like, why? Because my mama tells me a story. She says, um, I don't know if you know this, but when babies were born before, maybe they still do this. They, they, if you're not born crying, they try to get the baby to cry. And my mom says that when I was born, I wasn't crying. So they, they held me by the hands and kind of gave me a little, little swat to get me to cry. She says, I did start to cry. I also started to pee, peed on the doctor, the nurse, <laughs> peed all, just peed all over the room. So I'm scared to find out what Rebecca would have named me. That would have... That would not be good. Trouble, I'm sure. So either way, let's get back to the story. I told you this is going to be funny. It's a good day. The Bible's cool, man. You guys have to read the Bible and understand that what you're reading is real. Picture it in your mind as you're reading it. Understand that there's real motions in the room. It's not just words on a page. So either way, so we have Esau and Jacob, right? These are the two boys. They're twins. They're brothers. But listen, guys, they're very different. 
Uh, that's something that's different. A lot of times when we think of twins, my sister just had twins a couple of mo- about a month ago. And in my brain, I'm like, they're gonna look alike, smell alike. They probably both raised their hands. No, 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 no. Like, they're, these guys are twins, but they're very different. Not only is Esau hairy and Jacob not so hairy, right? But even their personalities are different. And as they grow up, uh, they, you can see that. It really comes to, to, to fruition, how different they are. And the Bible tells us, verse 27 and 28, it says, as the boys grew up, Esau became a skillful hunter, and he was an outdoorsman. But Jacob had a quiet temperament, preferring to stay at home. Isaac loved Esau because he enjoyed eating the wild game Esau brought home. But Rebekah loved Jacob. Even their parents kind of leaned in to each of them, right? I love all my kids the same. (laughs) Jacob was more of a homebody, right? That's what we learned from this. Jacob liked to be at home. He was, he was mom's favorite. In my mind, I got to be honest, I, I think he was probably a bit of a mama's boy a little bit, right? He, he was good with staying at home. He was good with, with spending time in the quiet with his mom, taking care of like, you know, different things like that. Esau, on the other hand, um, he was all about being outside. That kid was outside and he was dirty. Wherever you saw him, he was always outside. He became a skillful hunter. Arr, 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 arr. You know, he's like, he's, he's that kind of a guy. You know, a guy's guy, I guess you could say. And the Bible tells us that Esau, on the other hand, was loved by his dad, right? So you have Esau, who loves to hunt the food. And then you have Jacob, who's good at cooking the food, Right? That's really who you have, these two guys. Now, I want you to understand that. You have to understand that to understand how this trade comes to happen because it's about to all come together here, okay? You have these two guys, and pay attention, all right? The Bible says that one day Esau is outdoors. He's tired. He's been doing man stuff. Who knows what he's been doing? These, these, you know, who knows what he's doing out there? You know what I'm saying? Growling at something. And then his his brother at home is is actually at home cooking uh, a soup. And Esau gets tired. He gets tired. He gets hungry. So he's like, I'm just going to go home and get something to eat. But before, in my mind, before, you ever gone home and someone's been cooking all day? You don't even have to open the door. Like, you can smell it. And in my mind, he gets home and he's about to walk in and he's like, oh, I thought I was hungry a minute ago. I am, ooh, hungry now. What is that smell? That smells good. You know what it is? The soup. The soup his brother's been cooking. So he walks in and he sees his brother and then he sees the soup. This is what the Bible says, verses 29 and 30. One day when Jacob was cooking some soup, Esau arrived home from the wilderness, exhausted and hungry. And Esau said to Jacob, Esau says to his brother, I'm starved. Give me some of that red soup. Now, Again, I like to picture the Bible. It comes to life in my mind. So, you know, his brother walks in and he's like, yo, dude, I am so hungry. Hook a brother up. Now, I don't know if you have any siblings, but I'm sure the answer wasn't, oh, sure. (laughs) Right? I can imagine in my mind, Jacob looks at him and says, "Uh, hook you up with what? He's like, hook me up with what? With that soup, man. With that soup you've been cooking. Hook me up with some of that soup. Now, in my mind, I can imagine Jacob gets this like sly smile, like, oh, you want something I got? Like one sibling does to another. You know what I'm saying. And he's like, you want some of, mm. gets a spoon out, you know, gets a little bit of soup. Ooh, this is hot and delicious. You want some of this hot, been cooking all day soup, delicious soup. This, is this the soup? You want? And of course, his brother's like, yeah, I want some. That's, what, yeah. Give me some soup. And he goes, oh, hold on a second. Hold on a second. I'll give you some soup. This is where the trade comes in. I'll give you some of this delicious, hot, tasty soup, but it's going to cost you some. It's going to cost you your birthright. That's what Jacob tells his brother. Which sounds crazy. It sounds even crazier when you really understand what a birthright is. So let me explain what the birthright is, all right? The birthright is a huge deal, okay? In Jacob and Esau's culture, the firstborn male was considered to be super extra special for some reason. And just because he was born first, he didn't have to earn it. He didn't have to do anything for it. He, he, I mean, didn't, nothing, nothing else mattered other than he was born. He didn't even do anything to be born, okay? 
But just because he was the firstborn male, he was favored. Okay? It was almost as if he was chosen. And he would receive more than any of his other siblings when it comes to his inheritance. His birthright, when Esau gets a birthright, it meant that he would get a double portion of his dad's estate when he started off his life. That means he would get twice as much land, twice as many animals or flocks of animals, twice as many servants, twice as much as Jacob would ever get. That that was already in stone. That was already going to happen. Not only would Esau, check this out, not only would Esau get twice as much, right? Twice as much land, twice as many animals. He would also get to choose which ones he wanted. He would get to choose what land he wanted, what animals he wanted. So he not only got twice as much, he got the best of the best of all of it. This was a huge deal. That meant that the firstborn, right, the one with the birthright, would actually be set up for success for years to come. It was a generational thing, a favor that you would get that would change the trajectory of your life. So here's Jacob. And all he has is some soup right now. But can I tell you what else he has? Smarts. So he's sitting there and he goes, man, I see my brother wants something that I have. You want some of this soup, huh? So he makes him an offer. Um, I got to be honest. It seems like a dumb offer, right? A stupid offer. One of those things like, why would you even offer that? No one's going to accept that. Why would you even put that out there? But he offers this offer and he says, you know, let's see what happens. And he says, I'll give you the bowl of soup, but it's going to cost you your rights as the firstborn. And what's wild is what's happened. Because this is what happens. Watch this, verses 32 through 34. It says this, look, I'm dying of starvation. This is what Esau says. What good is my birthright to me now? Everybody say now. Do you understand what's happening right now? What I am starving, my hunger, my emotions, and what I feel have blinded me to the future, and I'm lost in the moment right now. What good is my birthright right now with what I feel right now? So Jacob said, well, first, okay, hold on. First, you must swear that your birthright is mine. So Esau swore an oath, thereby selling all his rights as the firstborn to his brother Jacob. Verse 34, then Jacob gave Esau some bread and some lentil soup. And Esau ate the meal, then got up and left. And when he did that, he showed contempt for his rights as the firstborn. What? What in the world? Jacob says, I'll give you a bowl of soup, but it's going to cost you your birthright. It's going to cost you your birthright. I'll, I'll, I'll satisfy your momentary thing that you need gratified. I'll give you some momentary gratification, but it's going to cost you something. It's called your birthright. And Esau looks at his brother and he says, dude, I'm starving to death. Man, what do I care about some birthright? You got a deal. Hook me up. And just like that, Esau gives up something great for something temporary. Do you see it? Do you see what's really happening here? He gives something up that's great for something that won't last. I mean, for a bowl of soup. You know what's wild? You know what's going to happen in about three, four hours after this? Esau is going to be hungry again. Like his situation did not change at all. Three or four hours, he's going to be starving to death. He's going to be hungry. He's going to want something else. Even the very thing that he thinks he's satisfying right now. On the other hand, Jacob now has his birthright. Right now, Jacob has something. He gained something that's going to change the trajectory of not only his life, but generations behind him. I want to, I want to grab Esau by the, I guess, by the hair. <laughs> All right? And be like, you're an idiot, man. How could you make such a dumb move? What were you thinking, bro? Right? 
You want to shake him and be like, come on now, what are you thinking? That's about the time God reminds me. Mike, you know, you, you've made trades like, just like this. As a matter of fact, that's when God said, you know what, you need to preach a sermon on this because there's a lot of people in the room who've made trades just like this. Trades where we've given up something great, God's great things for us for a momentary gratification. How many times have we fallen into the temptation of sin and in return traded away what Jesus offer us, offers us, the plans he has for us? How many times have we fallen for the lie that the enemy tells us that he says, listen, if, if, if it's the next thing that you give into that's gonna fulfill you. It's the next thing, the next line you cross that, that's gonna make you feel whole. It's gonna make you happy. I know this lie well because it's the same lie that I bought into over and over and over. I remember as a young man, man, going from relationship to relationship to relationship, always thinking that the, the next one is going to be the one that satisfies me. The next relationship, the next time a girl says she loves me, the next thing is going to be the thing that's going to make me feel valuable. It's going to make me feel like I got some worth because I don't feel like that on my own. And the truth is nobody feels like that on their own because we're not on our own. And no one else can fill that. No one but Jesus. But I would listen to the law and I would make that trade. As a matter of fact, I feel like if I went back, I didn't know I was doing this, but I would even trade one girl for the next one just because this one didn't satisfy those feelings. But all I would end up with was with guilt. All I had left at the end of that was shame. All I, all I found myself at the end of those times was, you know what, a moment of satisfaction that only three hours later, and it might be three days, it might be three weeks, but ultimately still feeling like I was alone and worthless and now I even carried more shame than I did to start. But then Satan would come back, man, because that joker doesn't give up, does he? He'd find me there in a pit of despair Wanting to change, wanting to be better, willing to try harder, but instead of listening to the truth, I'd listen to his lie one more time and make another trade. Mike, if you would just dot, 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 fill in the blank, right? The same lie that I'm sure a lot of you guys have heard. Mike, if you would just, um, if, you, if, you, if, if you were just liked enough, so you just got to do whatever you got to do to be liked and accepted by the group around you, because if you were liked enough, then you'd feel valuable, good, accepted, the list goes on and on, right? If you were just wealthy enough, if you, were, if you just looked good enough, right? If you just tried hard enough, if you were just smart enough, if you would just, and the list goes on and on and on. It's the same trade. He's just changing a few of the elements in the trade. If you were just blank enough, you would feel like you're worth something. And we fall for the lie, don't we? We fall for the lie and we think, okay, what do I need to do to get that, to gain that, that, that thing I'm searching for? And what do I got to do? Oh, I just got to drink alcohol? Like, that's all I got to do? Okay, well, I'm, I'm, okay, I'll cross that line. I'll, I'll do that. Or, or all I got to do is try this drug. And, and if I take enough drugs or enough alcohol, I'll forget my problems is what this world says. So trade that for forgetting your problems. But the truth is your problems are nowhere gone. They're still right there. So we make that trade. If I'll just date that person. If I just let him do, if I let her do, if I cross this line, right? If I just give in to anger. Man, we live in a world that tells you that you should be ruled by your emotions. And if you would just let your emotions roar out at everybody and not care about anybody else, then you'll feel better because you let it out. Man, that's garbage. That's a lie from the enemy trying to convince you to trade in God's plan for your life for his junk. The sad part is that we try and we try and we try so hard that we ultimately come to this great lie where he says, you know what? Why are you even trying? You should just trade all of it in and give up. You'll never be good enough, right? You'll never be smart enough. You'll never be pretty enough. You'll never be, the list goes on and on of his lies. And then ultimately we give up. And we trade it all in. I hate to say it this way, but like an idiot giving up his birthright for a bowl of soup. I'm not talking to you. I feel like I'm talking to me. Only to be left alone, right? Only to be left still feeling shame. Only to still feel guilt, right? Only to be left full of anger and hate, most of the time hating ourselves for the person we've become because we've made some trades. Sometimes we didn't even realize we were trading anything to begin with. And somehow we believe that what this world had to offer us was better than what Jesus had 
Listen to me, I know we know it, but we gotta hear it sometimes. Nothing this world or the enemy has to offer us comes even close to what Jesus has planned for us and what Jesus has for us. But here's the thing, right? We fall for this trade. I, I, at least, I'm, I, you know, one thing I'm grateful for is that Jesus gave us the Bible and his word that shows us that we're not the only ones that have fallen for this trade. And it's not just Esau and Jacob, right? People have been falling for, his, for his trades like this from the beginning. The enemy's slick, man. He's been playing this game for a long time. It's the same game he's still playing. He did it with Adam and Eve at the beginning of time. God makes Adam and he makes Eve out of Adam. And right now, God makes everything perfect at this moment. Everything is perfect. He makes the perfect place for them, the Garden of Eden. There's nothing wrong with this place. Everything is perfection. He has them have the perfect relationship. I don't know if people understand this, but in the Garden, between Adam and Eve, between them two, perfect relationship, perfect communication, no anger, no frustrations, no anxiety, no anything. Perfect relationship between them two. And then you have a perfect connection to God. God is not a prayer away. He's literally right there. They can talk to him, see him face to face, walk with him. And they do every single day, perfect connection. And God makes one request, just don't eat from the tree of life. And he does that, why? To give us free will. Do you understand that we have to have free will for love to be real? That's why that exists. People ask like, why would God make a broken world? He didn't make no broken world. He made a perfect world for us. The only thing he did was he didn't force us to be his like some minion. Instead, he said, I'm gonna give you free will to love and love me and choose me. And we didn't. That's why we live in this broken world. But this is what happens, right? Adam and Eve live in perfection. Everything is perfect. And Satan shows up and he walks over to Eve and, and Adam and he convinces them that what God has for them is not as good as what, he stopped, what he's hiding from them. He says, you need to trade in what God has given you and instead take a bite from that tree and you'll see that you'll gain what's even better. And foolishly, they make the trade. As a matter of fact, that trade has consequences that we're still living and walking out right now. But they're not the only ones in the Bible. As a matter of fact, you know, trades work both ways, right? You know that? There's good trades and there's bad trades. There's trades you should walk into and say yes. There's trades you could walk away from and say no. Both good and bad. Because there's a guy in Mark 10 that walks up to Jesus and Jesus says, I got a trade for you. And that guy chooses something opposite of Jesus. He, he runs up to Jesus and he says, hey, what do I need to do to get eternal life? I heard you're the guy to ask, a good guy to ask. And Jesus is like, listen, you got to follow the commandments. And the guy's like, nailed it. I follow all the commandments. And Jesus is like, oh, good. Here's the other thing you got to do. Go ahead and go and sell all your stuff and follow me. Does Jesus want all of us to sell all our stuff? Can anybody answer that? The answer is no. Right? But Jesus knows what each of us does have to do. And for this particular guy, Jesus knew that he had a lot of stuff and his stuff wasn't the problem. The problem was that he believed that his stuff is what fulfilled him. His stuff is where he found his identity and he thought his stuff is the thing that was completing him. And it wasn't his stuff, it was Jesus. And Jesus said, you know what? Here's what you need to do. You need to go trade your stuff out for me. You need to get rid of your stuff so that you recognize and realize that I am everything you need. That I am the one. So Jesus had a good trade for him, but you know what he did? He walked away. He said, nah, I choose my stuff over your plan. And I think there's some of us in this room that have done the same thing that he did. I think some of us have traded away in the past some plans for a bowl of soup. And some of us have walked away from Jesus when he said, hey, I got this plan for you. And we said, no, no, I choose my plan or my stuff or what I want over you. But I think today is the day where there's another trade to be made. And this time, you come out on the right side. This time, you don't get the bowl of soup. This time, you don't walk away from Jesus' plan. I believe that today is the day where you get the winning side of the trade. We're going to end with communion in just a little bit. So just put that down. We'll end with communion today. But before I get to that point, I, I want to give you guys an opportunity uh, to hear about one more trade in the Bible. 
There's three guys in the Bible. Their names are uh, Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego, all right? Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego, three guys. At, at this point in history, there's a king over them. Uh, his name is Nebuchadnezzar, okay? Not a great guy. But uh, the king makes this, um, what the Bible says, they, he makes this statue or he makes this, this thing made out of gold and he makes this decree across the land. Everyone needs to bow to this statue, to this image that he has made. The problem is that these three guys all believe in God, the real God. And they also know the commandments. And one of the commandments says that you shall not bow to any other image except God. So here's a king, and he's like, hey, you need to bow. And the guys are like, listen, I'm sorry, but we cannot bow. We refuse to bow. So they, everyone's bowing, but they refuse to bow because they're going to follow the word of God. And, and, and this is, it's not good, right? Like, you're not listening to the king, and people notice, and they bring the king. And to make a long story short, the king finally gets to the place where he's actually offering them stuff. He's like, listen, we'll give you this food, and we'll give you this, this stuff. I'll give you this stuff if you will just bow. I'll make you a trade. I'll trade you this stuff for your willingness to do what I'm telling you to do. And, and what do they say? No. We're not going to bow. Ultimately, the king gets so mad, he says, you know what? If you don't bow, I'm going to kill you. I'm going to burn you alive. I'm going to throw you into a furnace and burn you alive. And a lot of us like to listen to the, like, we remember the veggie tales. And we're like, oh, it's a fiery furnace. No, no, no. This is real fire that'll kill you and burn you alive. So he changes the trade. Do you understand that the trades have changed now, Right? A minute ago, the king was saying, hey, I'll give you good stuff, stuff you think you'll enjoy if you'll just do this. Now, he says, listen, bow and trade your walk with the Lord and receive a couple of nice things, or I'm going to kill you. I'm going to burn you alive. That's the trade they now have. Now, I don't want you to miss what they have to say, so I want everybody to close their eyes so you can hear me clearly. Just focus on what I'm saying Because I want you to hear, I'm going to read from the Bible, I'm going to read to you what these guys' response is when finally their life is on the line and the trade is put before them. They could bow and sell out the plan God has for them, or they can lose their life. That's their options. This is what they say. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego replied, O Nebuchadnezzar, we do not need to defend ourselves before you. If we are thrown into the blazing furnace, the God whom we serve is able to save us. And he will rescue us from your power, your majesty. But even if he doesn't, let me say that one more time. But even if he doesn't, nah, y'all ain't hearing me, listen. But even if our God doesn't, we want to make it clear to you, your majesty, that we will never serve your gods or worship the gold statue you have set up. Now, I don't know about you, but I want this to be my response every time Satan tries to tempt me. Every time he comes at me with some trade to trade in what God has for me for what he has or, or he threatens me or he, he puts some kind of, you know, some, and when I'm going through a season and that's hard and I feel like, man, I feel like I'm just being attacked and I just need a way out. Like, I don't want to give in anymore. I want to be able to say like these guys, no, 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 Satan, I ain't bowing. I'm not trading my God and his plans for anything you got. Even if you try to kill me, I ain't bowing. Even if the season seems hard, even if I don't understand why I'm going through it, even when it feels like it's unfair, even when the doctor gives me the bad note and everybody around me says I need to give in, listen, I am not going to go your route. The trade is off. I say no. Why? Because even if my, my God can save me, but even if he chooses not to, I still ain't trading him for you. I still ain't trading him for this moment of sin, this moment of gratification. I'm not in for that. Can you imagine what God could do in us, through us, if we stopped trading in his plan for this sin, for the world's lies? I think we would be shocked what would happen in our lives. Now the truth is, I think there's a good chance there are some here today that know they've made a bad trade. I mean, you knew God. You, you, you maybe even lived for him for a while, but somewhere along the journey, you 
You made a bad trade. Maybe you didn't even recognize that you were making a trade, but you traded his plan for one of the enemy's lies. You had a chance to say no. You had a chance to say, no, I'm not turning from God like those three guys did, but you didn't. Instead, you gave in to this world. You, you gave in to sin, and, and the truth is, since you did, man, you, you felt the shame, and you, you felt the guilt, and now you're carrying it. You're walking around with this guilt and shame that you were never meant to carry. Listen to me. Listen carefully. You don't have to carry that guilt and shame anymore. It's not by chance that you find yourself here today. I don't think that was by chance at all. God wanted you here today because he wants to offer you another trade. And this trade is for both those who knew him once and are no longer following him, but also those that have never known him before. Jesus is using me to tell you this trade, and this is what he says. He looks at you and he says, I want to make you a trade. I'll give, why don't you give me your sin? Why don't you give me your guilt? Why don't you give me your sickness, your loneliness, your broken heart? Give me your failures. Come on now, give me your, that unforgiveness that you've been carrying for so long, that anger and that, that hate. Give me your addictions, man. Give me your shame. And in turn, I'll give you my grace. I'll give you my forgiveness. I'll give you a love like you've never known before, a joy and a peace that goes beyond your circumstances. Ones that no one can take away from you. He looks at you and he says, I can make you clean. I can make you whole. You no longer have to live and walk this life out alone because I'll never leave you is what Jesus says to you. He says, just give me your junk. I'll make you a trade. Give me your junk and I'll give you a fresh start, a clean slate, and it comes with eternal life. So that's the trade. That's the trade he offers you today. The only question is, will you accept it? Will you give him your heart and receive his in return? So with every head bowed and every eye closed, listen, if you're here and you would say, yeah, that's me, I am in Pastor Mike, I want to give him my heart. It's messed up, it's, it's scarred, it's broken in some places, but I'll give him my heart and I'll receive his in return. I'll take his grace, his joy, his peace, his fresh start. If that's you, then I want you to open your eyes right now. Don't worry about anybody else. Listen, you might be the only one that opens their eyes in this room, and that's okay. Maybe Jesus loves you so much he's willing to preach an hour sermon to hundreds of people in a room simply to tell you he loves you and he wants to give you another shot. But if that's you, go ahead and open your eyes right now. I want to accept Jesus. I want to receive him. I need grace. I need forgiveness. I want to make this trade. Listen, I'm not going to embarrass anybody. I'm just going to pray a prayer, but I want to know who I'm praying it with. If your eyes are open right now and you're saying, yeah, that's me, could you get my attention? I'm just going to tell you to put your hand down, but I just want to see who it is. I see you. I see you right there. Yep, you can put your hands down once I see you. It's hard to see because of these lights. I see you up there. Yep. I see you right there, girly. I see you, little man. Yep. I see all three of you there, all four of you actually there. And I see you guys and I see you, bro. Yep. I see you. So does Jesus, girl. He sees you. Come on. I see you right there. Yep. I don't want to miss anybody. I see you, bro. Come on, Jesus. Do your thing. I see you in the back. Or anybody else? I see you right there. Yep. Awesome. Awesome. I'm going to wait just another second, just in case. I just... Don't let the enemy lie to you right now, man. He's probably lying to somebody right now. Don't let him lie to you. This is for you. I see you right there, girly. Yep. Jesus loves you. You know that? Yep. All right. Let's pray this prayer before we take communion together. If you raised your hand, I want you to say this because the Bible says if you confess with your mouth, that means you got to say something and you believe it in your heart that today is the day of salvation. So would you pray something like this? You can use your own words, but would you say, Jesus, thank you for seeing me, for loving me, for choosing me, even before I ever chose you, Lord. Thank you for trading your life for mine. I see that. 
God, I am so sorry. I'm so sorry for my sin, for the things I've chosen, the things I've done. I am so sorry for all of that, Lord. I, I give you my heart. It's broken. It's messed up. My life. It's not what I'd like to give you, but here's what I am. But I accept who you are. So I accept your grace and your forgiveness, your love, your peace, your joy. I believe that you died on a cross for me and then you rose again for me and because of it, you can pay a price that I can never pay and I accept that price that you've paid. Thank you for making me new. I am yours now, which means I am new now. I am, I am filled with joy. I can be filled with love and purpose. Lord, would you do all those things in me? Would you help me, Lord, to, to live for you for the rest of my days? Surround my life with people that are gonna help me walk this out. Fill me with your Holy Spirit and lead me. I am yours forever. I am yours. In Jesus' name, everybody said? Come on, everybody said? Let's give God some praise in this place. He is good. Come on. All right, you should have one of these. If you didn't get one, it's a little communion cup with the wafer on it and stuff. If you didn't get one, just throw your hand up. There's ushers, they'll come down and, and bring you one. All right, there's one up here. We need one up here, Sam, if you wanna get one. I think there's an extra one right there on that pew. Awesome. Just wave your hand there, they'll get it to you. Start opening them up. Yeah, they're not easy to open, so start opening them up. When we were in staff and uh, we're, we talk about each week as it's coming and, and Clarissa said, oh, we have communion this week. I was like, oh, perfect. We'll do it at the end because I want to end with the greatest trade of all. The greatest trade is what we're going to celebrate in just a second where God says, I'll trade my life for yours. I'll trade my goodness for your sin. I'll, I'll, I'll trade your brokenness and I'll give you my wholeness and my love. How good is that? Isn't that good? Go ahead and stand up with me. Everybody stand up. Pull out that little bread or wafer or whatever this thing is. Go ahead and hold it up right here. Jesus, this little wafer right here, man, it represents your body. Your body that you traded, that you allowed to be broken for us, Lord. I don't understand why you would do that, but I am grateful that you did, Lord. You are good. You are worthy to be praised, Lord. And we remember what you did for us. And we say, thank you, Jesus. Thank you so much for it. You can take the bread. And now, Lord, we hold up this juice and it represents your blood that was shed for us. A God that would allow his body to be torn, his flesh to be broken, his blood to be shed so that it would blot out our sins? God, that doesn't even make sense. What an incredible trade you made for what? For us. And I don't understand why you would do that, but God, I am so thankful that you did. Where would we be without you, God? Thank you for allowing your body to be broken, your blood to be shed. We remember what you did, Lord. We celebrate you and we thank you. We thank you that we can turn to you, that you're not a far off God. Thank you for allowing your blood to be shed. In Jesus' name, go ahead and take the juice. Now throw your hands up in there. And let me pray a blessing over you before we head out. Jesus, you are good and you are worthy to be praised, Lord. And we're gonna live on our lives like you are good and you are still on the throne, Lord. We have victory because of you. It does not matter what the news say. It does not matter what's going on around us. You are in control and you are still on the throne, Lord. So we love you, Lord. Would you fill us with your Holy Spirit? Send us into our city, into our schools, into our jobs with the love of Jesus, that we can be your hands and feet, that we can serve and love the broken and the lost. Give us a chance this week to invite somebody to Easter, to tell them about who you are and what you're doing in our lives, Lord. Fill this place with broken people. We thank you that we get a place to meet. But Lord, it's not filled. Why? Because there's still space. Because we still got work to do. That's why. So help us, Lord. Give us a boldness, Lord, to go out and live this out. You traded your life for ours. Jesus, we now trade our lives back for others, Lord, because that's what you called us to. We love you.
And we thank you, Lord. So I pray blessings over every person, protection, Lord, health in the name of Jesus, favor in every direction that they go to, Lord. We love you. Lord, be loud because we're chasing you. Just point the direction. In Jesus' name, everybody said. Come on, everybody said. I love you guys. Don't forget to check out the Dream Team booth. We love you guys.